Our speaker today has become a very familiar face to most Capitol observers. After a long career in the Assembly, he was elected to the Senate in 2006. Uh, during Senator Steinberg's career, he's been the driving force behind some of the most significant legislation in recent California history, including a major expansion of community mental health programs and the first bill in the nation that links land use decisions to greenhouse gas reduction goals. Long considered one of the hardest workers and best problem solvers in the Capitol, Steinberg's Senate colleagues elected him the leader of that body in August of 2008. His ascension has come during what many observers consider to be the most challenging and tumultuous economic times since the Great Depression. Since then, as an integral part of the Big Five, he has been steeped in daily negotiations to resolve our state's little budget gap issue. He is here today to share insights into that process. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senate Pro Tempor of the California State Senate, the Honorable Daryl Steinberg. Thank you, man. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Rich, for the introduction. Congratulations on uh, becoming the new president of the Capitol Press Club. Thank you to the club for putting on this wonderful lunch. I actually had three bites of my chicken, and I'm <laughs> happy about that. Um, congratulations to John Myers for uh, ending his uh, tenure and responsibility in a very successful way. And um, so I'm here today, and I, I, I'm just having a hard time understanding why all the attention, why all the interest. I. <clears throat> And so I, you know, I, I've had a few weeks to, you know, prepare for this uh, talk and um, thought about what I wanted to talk about, what's sort of topical in the news. And so the title of my speech today is <clears throat> Eight Babies, Too Many or Too Few? <laughs> Just thought it would be of interest to you, that's all. You know, it's... it's uh, they, they say that uh, timing in life is everything, right? And so uh, Jim and Alicia, my very uh, able communications folks, have you know had this on the calendar for some time, and we thought to ourselves, well, geez, you're talking February the 11th. Uh, this budget negotiation will be over, and this will be a great time for me to take the podium as my debut talk before the press corps uh, and to be able to regale you with all of the stories of what went on and to talk about the particulars and to go through, you know, the various trade-offs. Well, I guess uh, the lesson for me is that you can't always control the timing of things because uh, as and I wasn't going to cancel the speech, by the way. Um, but yes, thank you. A little applause there. Appreciate that. Um, but I must say that uh, the timing of my talk today is awkward. Because we have, uh, the legislative leaders and the governor, have steadfastly tried to maintain the confidentiality of these discussions. And I want to talk about that in a couple of moments, uh, about how I feel about that and lessons learned and what it says about our process. But I know that um, one newspaper broke a, broke a capital alert saying there was a deal and, and so I, I thought maybe you'd be interested in me taking a moment or two and I suppose all the questions uh, will be appropriately about the budget but let me just in all candor tell you that um, this is difficult, because I pride myself on being uh, someone who communicates easily with the press and the public. I got nothing to hide, and yet I have an obligation to see this process through. So this is what I want to tell you. The term deal, I think, gets overused. Uh, there is no deal. There is no deal. Until, until some of the loose ends are worked out, until there is a clear uh, and complete review of 
very, very complicated language. And until the votes themselves are ready to go. Having said that, among the leaders and the governor, there is an agreed upon framework. There is an agreed upon framework. All is moving in a positive direction towards resolution. The staff, the incredible staff on both sides of the aisle and the leaders and the governor are working to iron out the few remaining loose ends. We hope and anticipate and expect a vote within the next couple of days. Until all of that is complete, there is no deal in the way that I think you and all of us are used to describing uh, such a term. But we are all aware, and I certainly as one leader, and I'm see, I'm, I think I can speak on behalf of everyone who is involved in this situation, feel the urgency and feel the absolute need for quick and responsible action. We must avert the stoppage of 142 Caltrans transportation projects and the jobs that these projects create. That's something that is going to occur this week. We must avert mass layoffs. We must avert IOUs. We must avert the continuing downward rating of our credit. And most importantly, we must end the fear and the anxiety that Californians feel today. I will be glad to answer some questions with a little bit of detail about the framework um, when we open it up to questions and answers. But let me just make, if I might, a few other remarks. These are extraordinary times. And <clears throat> I've been the pro tem now for 72 days. <laughs> and every day has rightfully been consumed with trying to solve this problem. And you know the brief history of what we attempted to do in December and how that didn't work and we've come back together with the Republicans and the governor in good faith. The negotiations have been productive they have been difficult. <clears throat> but everybody has had their eye on the prize, and that is putting this crisis behind us in California so that we can move on to building a positive agenda and accomplish positive things for the people of California. And so the manner in which we are attempting to complete this framework and get to the floor is as well, extraordinary and unorthodox. And frankly, there is a lot to criticize about this process. For me personally, this has been a trial by fire. I've been involved in a lot of difficult negotiations in my life. SB 375, prior budgets, its budget chair, when I was in private sector, I was involved in a couple of well-chronicled negotiations regarding a last place basketball team. Um, nothing, nothing compares to this experience. The difficulty, the complexity, and the stakes for people. I feel it every day. I feel the weight and know that I and my other colleagues involved in, in these negotiations as well as the staffs are doing everything we can to get this done and to get it done responsibly. No one likes the secrecy of the Big Five. It's not the way the process should happen. I will freely admit that it's not the way the process should happen. And yet, given the time frame that we have been dealt Again, 72 days as pro tem. 
Given the extraordinary circumstances, it demands, in my view, and has demanded an extraordinary structure and an extraordinary process to make sure that we meet the bottom line, which is to solve the problem and to get the crisis behind us. But I think the fact that we have to, that we've kept this a closed door negotiation does in fact speak to why the capital environment itself is dysfunctional and what work we have to think about going forward. Why is it that we're forced into these circumstances? I mean, you can start with the two-thirds requirement and the fact that it takes a supermajority to get anything big like this done. Take the prominence of interest groups and stakeholders on all sides. And the fact that the minute something gets out, we are, all of us, regardless of what issue or what side, we're pummeled with how can you do that? How can you possibly do that? We're doing what we're doing because we must. I don't know any good I don't know any good news to come out of solving a $41 billion deficit in terms of the substance. The only good news is getting it behind us responsibly and being able to move this state forward. But given that reality and given the fact that there is such sensitivity around the tax issue, around the, quote, economic stimulus issues, around the cuts, around the spending restraint, cap, rainy day fund, call it whatever it is you want to call it, we felt, and I suppose we'll take the hits for it, that this is the only way we could solve the single largest budget deficit in the state's history and do so in an ironic way at the earliest date in the history of a California state budget. That's the plus sign. But there are lessons learned, and certainly once this is over, I want to pivot. I want to pivot in terms of doing everything I can to make sure that this process itself is not secret, that the work we do is transparent, that the process itself is accessible to real people, and that we begin to transform the culture of the legislature from one that, um, that frankly is not held in very high esteem to a body that is seen as the pride of the country. We're gonna emphasize real oversight of how government works. We're gonna make that as or more important than the bills we introduce and, and the, the laws we attempt to generate every year. And we're gonna focus on the only thing that, in my view, people ought to evaluate us upon, and that is what, what do we produce? You heard me my first day, I think, some of you, when I spoke uh, as I was sworn in as the new president pro tem, this could be a great year for California. We get this behind us. We work with the federal government. We take the first step towards universal health care and provide coverage for all kids, and we need to do that right away. We need to get a renewable energy bill, a 33% standard done within the next 45 days in the legislature. We need to get right on water. The budget was a crisis, is a crisis, certainly water is a crisis as well. And there's an agreement to be had here, and frankly, as difficult as water is, after going through it, we've gone through the last 71 days, bring it on. I don't, <laughs> Come on, let's sit down for a couple hours and work this thing out. I mean, I, I think it'll, I, I think it might just pale in comparison. And of course, you've heard me speak, and I'd love to give a whole talk on this at some point, about how we need to build an economic development strategy in this state that focuses not just on job creation, but links that job creation back to the reform of middle and high schools in California career pathways for every kid, no more dropouts. Every kid should have the opportunity to go to college and if they're not gonna go to college, they ought to be educated and trained for a middle class wage or better in one of the emerging growth areas of the economy. 
And everything we do with infrastructure going forward, everything we do with tax credits, everything we do with, that, that tries to incentivize job creation, there must be one quid pro quo in my view. And that is, if you're the recipient of public dollars, you go into the eighth, ninth, and 10th grades, and you establish those career academies so that there's a direct connection between the jobs we're creating, the growth of our economy, and the education and training of young people who otherwise will end up disproportionately in the Department of Corrections or dependent upon California's social welfare system. That's my real agenda for California. Thank you for having me. I look forward to your questions. Okay, we're going to take some questions. Please identify uh, your name and your affiliation, please. Yeah, George Skelton, LA Times. I've, I've heard of you, yes. Yeah. What happens with uh, Proposition uh, 98? Uh, when you raise the taxes, does the money go into the 98 formula, or do you, do you bypass that somehow? Well, the framework, again, uh, that, that uh, as I said earlier, there is an agreed-upon framework. The framework uh, includes fully respecting Proposition 98. And that means that uh, when revenue rises, that does impact the Prop 98 level. And it also means that uh, over time, that education, uh, K-14 education, will have the ability to recover uh, the, the, the funding levels lost as a result of some various serious cuts that have to be made in the short term. Now, you know, every, anyone who understands Prop 98 and tests ones, two, or three, raise your hand. Um, I, I understand it certainly better than I did uh, before this negotiation. But <clears throat> there is a difference between paying back money that has been lost, which you can't do given the severity of the crisis, and making sure that the funding level uh, is restored eventually. And that's what we are working with. Senator, over here. Brian Joseph, Orange County Register. Hi, Brian. Senator, uh, when a deal is reached, can you guarantee and have you guaranteed that all members of your caucus will vote for the agreement? Well, since I'm not a ventriloquist and can't actually channel their voices when it comes time to say yes or no, uh, the answer is I expect all Democratic members to vote for the budget. Absolutely. No exceptions. Senator, we have one over here, too. Over here, sorry. Yes. To, your, to your right. Senator. Hi, Hi Kevin. Kevin Riggs. Kevin Riggs from KCRA. Uh, the uh, tax package, as you know, many of these taxes you're talking about, sales and gasoline, are regressive in nature. Some groups have estimated it would cost an average family an extra thousand bucks a year. What would you tell those families about the need to absorb that burden, especially in this climate? I, I would tell those families, just as President Obama is telling the families of this country, that we are living in the midst of the worst national and international economic crisis in decades. And that there must be, in order for us to get through this together, there's going to have to be shared sacrifice. I would also say to those families that as painful as those facts you just laid out are, it would be worse, it would be worse if we had to cut an additional $15 billion worth of public education funds, higher education funds, and, and, and investments in health and human services. And so this is, there's no, been no secret, we've talked about a four-legged stool all along, revenue, cuts, reform, and economic stimulus. And in order to do this, get this done responsibly with the least amount of pain as possible, there needs to be both new revenues and expenditure reductions. But to do it all on one side of the ledger 
would be much more painful than balancing it out. Senator, we're here at the back of the room, right back here. Hi, Nanette Hi, Miranda, Nanette. <laughs> KBC Los Angeles. Um, in your framework, does it include any environmental or labor laws uh, relaxed or changed in any way? And if you could be a little specific. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> you know, the, I would say that um, a significant amount of time during the really the 70 plus days of negotiations, if you include the December negotiations, have been spent on this issue of economic stimulus. And certainly Democrats and Republicans come at this issue in a very different way. Reasonable people differ. Republicans say, well, the reason why our economy is in bad shape in part is because government and its regulations are strangling the ability of business to create jobs. Democrats, by and large, would say that if you really want to improve the economy, better make sure that working people make a wage that allows them to contribute something back to, to the economy. And, you know, there's always gradations in between, and, you know, it's not absolute, but that's sort of the general parameter of the debate. On the environment, uh, some Republicans argue that AB 32, for example, and they were very clear, a number of the Republicans in the House did not vote for AB 32, stands in the way of economic development. Democrats believe that AB 32 may be the single greatest opportunity to expand the economy because look at what we may be able to do uh, when it comes to alternative energy and, and the green economy. And so at the end of the day, uh, we struck what I think is a pretty classic compromise. We gave on some things, we gave on some things, and we didn't give on other things. And those details will be out, uh, you know, will be out in the next day or so. But it, it was, that, that was a classic give and take. And frankly, it was probably the most difficult part of the entire lengthy negotiation. Senator, we got another one back here, over here. Senator J.G. Preston, Capital Television News Service. How would you characterize the uh, spending cap that you're looking at in the compromise? Well, again, terminology to me can be a little dangerous because it, you know, it gets politicized, right, depending upon one's views of, uh, of the measure. But what we, what we are attempting to do is as follows. We are trying to deal with uh, the incredible volatility of California's revenue stream. And until the tax commission comes back and until we get to the ballot for significant constitutional reform, especially on the tax side, we are living with a system that has these audacious peaks and valleys. And so what the spending restraint, that'll be the term that I will use, uh, you can pick your term, what, what it does is it takes out some of that volatility by ensuring that when the spike is up, we capture that money in a more significant way and, and put it into a reserve so that when the spike goes the other way, we have, we have something to fall back on. I, I tell you, how different this negotiation might have been and I'm, I'm defending the concept here now, okay? How different this negotiation might have been if California had, say, 12 to $15 billion in a, in a reserve account for just this kind of time. So as a Democrat, you know, it's really hard because I want to spend that money, that spike on career technical education and kids' health care and foster care and mental health. I got plans for that money. But I also recognize that one of the problems that we're all part of here is that I can, I have a hard time now as a progressive Democrat holding on to the mental health funds and the foster care funds and the education funds when the swing goes down and there isn't the money, there isn't the money to pay 
for those services. And so <clears throat> we're talking about evening out the spikes and making sure that we have more money uh, in the bank for us to weather the bad times. Senator here in the middle of the room. Yes, Jake. Right. Jake Henshaw, Gannett News Service. How much of the, um, the solution, the, the coming deal, does, depends on uh, the ballot and is temporary? Ooh, now, you're, now we're really getting into detail. There's no question that there will be at least a couple of ballot measures. I mean, if you're talking about spending restraint, um, rainy day fund spending cap, I'll just use all three terms. Maybe that's the way to do it. Uh, that has to go to the ballot. You're talking about constitutional reform, and there, there will be a couple of other ballot measures as well, given the, the architecture of, of the framework. When do we go to the ballot? I think sooner rather than later, but that hasn't been decided. Speak up. The, um, there are no permanent taxes. There are no permanent taxes. There are, there are temporary taxes depending upon depending upon the passage or failure, and the length depends on the passage or the failure of the spending restraint itself. And on the cut side, um, many of the cuts are permanent, but again, we fought hard, we were fought hard and are fighting hard to protect the integrity of Prop 98 and to do the very best we can to stand up for people in California who traditionally do not have a strong voice. Senator here at the back of the room, directly in front of you. Uh, Bob Moffitt, KFBK Radio. Uh, you I, mentioned earlier the two-thirds requirement vote. How will the state be stronger because Republicans held out when these negotiations are over? I don't, I'm not, I don't think I understand the question. The Republicans sorry. held out uh, and did not vote for the, the budget, and the governor also vetoed the, uh, the last proposal. Are you talking about the December package? Yes. How, how, after this proposal is done, after this is all over, how will the state be in a stronger position because the Republicans held out? Well, you know, I don't want to give them too much credit here. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, the fact of the, the, fact of the matter is... Uh, I'd rather solve a $41 billion problem at one time than an $18 billion problem. So if it, if it all ends well, then uh, all, that, all that pain during December and the holiday, uh, holiday time will have been worth it. Because, you know, one thing leads to another. I will say this. I'd like to think, and I, and, and I believe it, that what we did in December to sort of threaten the sanctity of the two-thirds did in fact, um, was in fact one of the key factors that led our Republican colleagues to the table because that was the first time that they saw that maybe we could do, maybe we could do some of this or maybe even all of it uh, without them. Senator, and, we've got another one back here in the Dan back Walters room. over there too. I don't want to miss Dan Walters. Dan, I'll be right there. Okay. Actually, after her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he always is speaking. <laughs> Araceli Martinez with La Opinion. I would like to see if you can tell us how are you planning to avoid the layoff of thousands of workers? Where are you going to get the savings to avoid well, that? Well, the governor um, said, his, his, his spokespeople said over the last couple of days that one of the keys to averting massive layoffs is getting a budget agreement and, of course, signing contracts, collective bargaining agreements with uh, the state employee unions and you know on both fronts as and I know one for a fact and I know for the other through what I know on both ends things are moving in a very positive direction okay now mr. Walter right, Daryl uh, as I understand it the uh, agreement uh, a concession to the Republicans as it were was the a fairly significant corporate tax break for California corporations, uh, maybe as much as a billion dollars. How do you justify that in light of raising taxes on everyone else and cutting the health and welfare programs and the education and so forth? 
first of all, um, I'm not sure your number is correct. Uh, so let's... As much as... as we'll, we'll await the details, but uh, I'm not sure your number is correct. Look at when you are involved in a negotiation to solve a $41 billion problem, you make some choices uh, and give some things that you don't want to give. I could, when you look at this thing, and if you gave me my ability as single legislator, Sacramento, to vote yes or no on many of these items, I'm a no. I'm a no. But I don't have that luxury. My job as one of the two lead negotiators on the Democratic side is to protect education, to protect health and human services, to protect the social safety net, and to try to bring this to a closure as quickly as possible and in, in as a responsible way as possible. And to do that, you make compromises. That's what it's about. Senator, over here to your right. Senator Juliet Williams, Hi, Associated Juliet. Press. Um, how much of your plan relies on federal money? Well, <clears throat> the framework itself does include, um, does include uh, the recognition that we will in all likelihood get significant federal dollars. But it does not rely on those dollars for the $41 billion solution. In other words, if we get the money, it may make some of the cuts and some of the taxes less, uh, it, you know, less painful. If we don't get the amount of federal money that we hope for, then it'll make both the cut side and the tax side a little bit more painful. So we think we did a pretty good job, actually, in not over-relying over -relying on the federal dollars. But if we are fortunate enough to get them, it, it eases the pain on all sides. We have time for a few more. Laura. Hi, uh, Bill Bradley, New West Notes in the Huffington Hi, Post. Hi. Um, uh, we heard your optimism about uh, moving forward on other thorny issues after this budget uh, problem is finally resolved, but frankly, the, the state is already going over Niagara Falls uh, in terms of the government uh, not being able to fund issues. Why are you optimistic about uh, water and other such issues? Because if we can, if we can get this done, if we can solve a $41 billion problem, in February of 2009, and I know it's, I, I know that February is not early enough, but if we can do that, we can, we can solve about anything. I mean, I've been involved in the water issue. I was chair of the Water and Resources Committee last year. I know the elements of a, a water deal, water investment. I know exactly what they are. I know what the holdup is. And I'm ready with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, in both houses, and the speaker and the governor to get right in there and, and figure those last points of contention out. Um, you know, I mean, I, if you look at my record, um, you'll see that uh, my colleagues elected me to this spot, I think, because I actually do get things done. Um, sometimes it takes a little longer than I would like, but we do, we get things done. And that's, you know, as I've said, that's the only way to measure a public official or a public body. So what do you get done? I hope people will look next week back at this and say, imperfect, a um, lot of things in there I don't like, but they got the job done. Senator right here. Laura Mahoney with BNA. I'm going to give it a shot and ask you if you'll tell us what specific tax proposals are in the deal or no deal that you have. I would just say this, um, that those who, reported, uh, those who reported over the last 12 hours on what might be in, what might be uh, part of the revenue package, they're good reporters, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Senator, yeah. I think we have one right here. Uh, yes, Hilton Collins with Government Technology Magazine. In January, um, the Assembly also proposed a green economic stimulus plan. Um, if all goes well and that um, goes through, I know your plan talks about adopting um, green jobs was one of the things you proposed. Does that incorporate adopting any sort of green technologies as in software that monitors, you know, organizations' energy consumption or teleworking opportunities so that workers can work from home and reduce emissions by not having sure. to drive to work? Probably not part of this framework, but certainly an issue we will tackle as the year goes on. Probably have time for one or two more if uh, Mikko's hands. Hi. <laughs> <coughs> We're going to the back of the room, Senator, back here. Okay. Hi, thanks very much. Hi, Senator. Julia Mitrich, KPCC News, Southern California Public Radio. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, that this process, uh, the secrecy and the budget negotiations have been or unorthodox, uh, that you're uncomfortable with, with the closed door uh, that has been the case this time, and, and that you'd like to do a pivot and change it, and, and it sounded like maybe burst the bubble of special interest pre pressure. What will you do specifically that would change the conditions uh, in the Capitol and make future budget negotiations open to regular people, as you said? Well, there are a few places to start. Um, first of all, it kind of has gotten lost in the last, again, two and a half months, but I did something unprecedented and appointed every member of the Senate to the Budget Committee. Usually the budget is the domain of, you know, 14, 15 members and I think that sort of leads to, you know, a tendency a little bit more towards secrecy. So I want every member participating uh, in the substance of the budget. Secondly, we're going we're gonna to take the budget committee itself to the floor of the Senate um, as a regular practice so that we're not just always voting, you know. I know you guys use, like, use the word drill a lot, and, and, you know, I guess sometimes we do do drills. But I think what's, what's the flip side of that is that where is there the public discussion, the full light of the television cameras about the various issues that we're going to be called upon to vote on later, uh, later in the year? And then third, Again, it's gotten a little bit lost, even in terms of my own attention, because of the crisis. But we are going to bring back, together with the speaker, it's doing the same thing, we're going to bring back genuine legislative oversight to the legislature in ways that has not been seen in decades, where we really use the public process to examine the performance of government and whether or not it's achieving the outcomes, a particular program is achieving the outcome that promises. We have time for one more question. Hi, Judy. Hi, Judy. Hi, with the AP. Um, is the lottery part of the solution? And if so, how can you say that it's solved if it's borrowing from the future? Well, the lottery, if you remember in September, the last budget, the legislature passed by two thirds supermajority to place the securitization of the lottery on the ballot. That remains part of this framework, remains part of this framework. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? There are probably better ways. Uh, but again, when you're trying to minimize the pain on both the, expend on both the cut side and the tax side, it's one small piece of, of a much larger framework. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's a tremendous amount of time.